so I'll be talking, uh, trying to give you an overview of the status and uh, uh, different types of simulations of cosmic reionization um, in this talk. Uh, so I will be, I'll be, it's a review talk, so I'll be talking about uh, uh, a lot of different types of research, not all of them my own. But uh, I've worked on simulations of cosmic reionization since about 2005. And over the years, I've collaborated with many people, PhD students, postdocs, uh, and more senior people. And I, I thought I, I would want to list them here. Um, you may recognize some of the names. I think some of them are actually in the audience. Um, and um, uh, of course, I've learned a lot from, from working with all these people. So thank you. Uh, so the overview, the talk, uh, three parts, you could say, I'll start with a, a background. So why do we want to use simulations of cosmic reionization and, and what do we want to do with them? Um, then uh, most of the talk will be an overview of the, what I think are the four basic types of simulations. Um, uh, so there, there are different choices that can be made and I'm trying to... Um, I will give you an overview of those uh, types. And then I'll have a very brief end where I say a little bit about the relation between these different two types of simulations and how we how we should view them. So let's start with the basics, though, reionization. Um, I'm, I will be assuming that most people here actually know quite a bit about reionization and the way we study it. Um, but I, I'll, I'll just, you know, just briefly, of course, reionization is the period in the history of the universe, uh, which coincides with the emergence of the first um, stars and galaxies. So the first uh, real structures to form um, and uh, radiation from those structures changed the intergalactic medium. So the baryons outside the galaxies from being cold and neutral to being hot and ionized. Um, and it's often um, indicate, it's often illustrated with these kind of history diagrams shown here from a very early review by Renan Marcana, where you have redshift or time on the x-axis going here from time going from right to left, um, and then some sort of spatial scale uh, on the on the y-axis um, and in this plot yellow is ionized and gray is neutral uh, so the universe recombined uh, at the epoch of recombination where the cmb was released the cosmic microwave background and then there followed the dark ages and then the first stars and galaxies emerged and they produced ionized regions around themselves which grew and merged and then led to a complete ionization of the intergalactic medium can you see my mouse Yes, we can. Yes, okay. Yes, we so can. I can use that to point. Um, um, and it's um, uh, so it's a it's reionization is because of baryonic processes happening um, uh, in the universe, um, uh, and it couples really it's 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 the it couples the smaller scales almost. So because the the photons that reionize the universe were ultimately produced by stars inside galaxies or maybe in accretion disks around uh, black holes. So these are very tiny scales, but they changed the global structures on the largest scales uh, of the universe. Now, in the beginning, uh, you, people often use these kind of re representations where it's more schematic and uh, simplified view. Uh, of how reionization developed here from right to left. Um, but of course, this is a very poor representation of actually what happened. Um, uh, and similarly, analytical models can only bring you so far. And why is that? It's a rather complex process, reionization. And its complexity lies into the different range of different scales that we have to capture. The fact that it's based on radiative processes and, and the generally underlying processes that that uh, determine how, how it proceeded uh, are quite complex and interacting. We'll talk about those in a minute more. Um, 
so these are the reasons to do simulations because we want to capture these complexities but actually all of them even when you do simulations arch are still challenging to uh to deal with so they're also the challenges for the simulators um just to give you a bit of an impression here's a, a movie we made quite a few years ago of a, a cosmic reionization simulation where we're following the ionized fraction yellow is neutral uh, and it will go through red to blue, but you see lots of small uh, ionized regions forming as the first stars and galaxies are forming and they're filling the space and they're forming quite complex patterns. And towards the end of the movie, you'll see bigger blue regions, which are larger ionized uh, regions where many of the small ionized regions have merged to form these bigger regions. Um, so this gives this is meant to give you a bit of a feeling what the complexity is and how different this is from the, the simple picture we just saw in the in the cartoon. Okay, so that was the end. Um, okay, so we want to capture these complexities, but but why, right? What would what do we want to do with the simulations? So I think there are base there are three basic things we want to uh, do use the simulations for the, the results. So the first one is to get a physical understanding of what's happening. Simulations are the laboratory tools of of astrophysics because we cannot uh, mo uh, we cannot study stars or or any astrophysical processes in the lab. So but we can simulate them and then just as the guy here is turning the knobs to try out what happens if we have a little bit more of this or a little bit less of that, you can do that with the simulations. Um, you can also then take the simulation outputs and turn them into mock observations and say, okay, if we observe this, this is what it would look like with this and this telescope, radio telescope, optical telescope. And that helps you then design the, the telescopes or the, your uh, observing strategy. It also allows you Another thing, similarly, if to develop new tools to say, okay, if we have these observations, we can analyze them using this statistical tool, and that will give us a better angle at, you know, to determine what actually happened. And lastly, then once you actually have your observations, you want to interpret your observations in terms of your model, which the model having certain parameters, and so you do model fitting and a parameter estimation, and you also for a complex uh, uh, process like reionization, you really need to do that with simulations. Now, those are the three uh, reasons we want to use simulation, what we want to use simulations for. So let's return to those complexities. So there are the scales, just to give you an idea. It's a global process in the intergalactic medium, so you, you need to follow it on essentially the largest scales, which would mean gigaparsec. We've studies have shown that it really to statistically capture the essence of reionization, you really you need hundreds of co-moving megaparsec in your simulation. Um, and for example, if you want to sample the relevant population of dark matter halos, which host the galaxies in which the stars are forming, megaparsec. On the other hand, if you consider the observations, specifically the radio observations of the redshifted 21 centimeter signal from the neutral hydrogen, which we think is the best, really the best observable to, to follow the process of reionization, those observations often target fields that are about 500 co-moving megaparsec uh, uh, on the sky. So if you want to mimic those observations, you need even bigger volumes. And if you want to consider very rare sources, maybe very rare quasar and its impact, then to properly do the sampling there, you would probably need a gigaparsec. So that's what we need for reionization as a process. At the same time, uh, things are happening in the intergalactic medium. Things, uh, photons are being absorbed there, the ionized, ionizing photons. And how they are absorbed depends on the density fluctuations in the intergalactic medium. And so we need to follow those really onto the scales where they're, where they're still relevant, which is about a proper kiloparsec. So this gives you about 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 uh, dynamic range in scales. But then if you want to follow, you know, how do the galaxies actually form stars? 
how do the photons escape from the galaxies, you have to go to even smaller scales and that will push up the dynamic range even more, something like 10 to the 8. So that's quite challenging. Then radiation, uh, simula simulating the transfer of radiation or the, how radiation spreads through space also uh, challenging because the radiation typically is a non-local effect rather you know compared to hydrodynamics which is a, a local uh, effect uh, it also often radiation has many frequencies that you may want to consider so for reionization there are three basic categories of radiation that we really need to follow. The, the basic one is the extreme ultraviolet, so the hydrogen and helium ionizing photons, because they determine what parts become ionized and what parts are still neutral. Uh, there are also, though, X-rays being produced inside those galaxies, and they're important for setting the temperature of the intergalactic medium, uh, which has an impact uh, on its structure, but also has an impact on the 21 centimeter signal. Another group of photons that is important for understanding the 21 centimeter signal that's being produced are the Lyman alpha photons or generally ultraviolet photons because they determine the so-called spin temperature, the level population, which then determines how strong the signal is. And lastly, there's a group of photons that's not important for those processes, but it's important for the star formation, the Lyman Werner photons which uh, affect how much molecular hydrogen there is which is important for uh, star formation so those are the different types of radiation and then of course there are the processes so we have this we want you know on in the intergalactic medium we have the gravity working mostly driven by the dark matter distribution structures forming there's gas there as well. This is the stuff that's getting ionized. Of course, the gas has a hydrodynamic response. These two work together. Collapsing structures in the dark matter scaffolding produce uh, dark matter halos. Gas falls in, and then you get star formation, galaxy formation. And once you have those galaxies forming, of course, there's uh, uh, there's evolution inside them. As stars form inside the galaxies, produce uh, feedback, mechanical, radiative, chemical feedback, which then changes the, the galaxy itself, which leads to more star formation, etc. But of course, for reionization, it's really important that some of the feedback, specifically the radiative feedback from the stars, goes back into the IGM and affects the, the hydrodynamics there. So ionizes and heats the, the gas in the intergalactic medium. And so all these processes are coupled and this creates a level of complexity which is requires simulations so now i want to look at these different types of simulations that we need um, and uh, i've divided it up into four types so the first type is let's say the full physics you try to include as much as possible then the other the second one i'll talk about is the other extreme uh, where you try to do everything as approximate as possible and then there are the two uh, sort of in between solutions uh, full radiative transfer and approximate radiative transfer it will become clear what these things mean as i as i describe them so the first type though is full physics um, so this means including as much of the physical processes that I just showed inside your simulation. So you want to follow both what's happening in the intergalactic medium with gravity, uh, with uh, ionizing photons uh, causing the ionization, but also following how stars are forming inside of galaxies and how galaxies are forming and, and, and evolving. So that's quite challenging. Uh, but actually, it's the oldest, I think the oldest reionization simulations back from the year 2000 were sort of of this type. The, they were done by, by Nick Canadian. But he could only do a really tiny volume of about 2 megaparsec. But there has been huge progress. And now the latest uh, simulations of this type actually can do 100 co-moving megaparsec. We'll look at them in a moment. We've seen quite a few trends here. You have to do the hydrodynamics here. Um, Previously, uh, cosmological simulations had a preference for a so-called smooth particle hydrodynamics. But for these kind of simulations, where you want to couple with the radiative transfer to know how ionization is pro progressing, you, you need a grid. 
or a mesh. Uh, and so all of these simulations are nowadays are, are using either these moving or adaptive mesh type uh, structures. And that allows you to do radiative transfer using the moments method, which I won't describe in detail, but it's a, it's a way, it's a method in which you describe photons as if it was a fluid although the pressure tensor, the underlying pressure tensor is, is anisotropic. So it, it's not exactly a fluid, but you can reuse some of the method, numerical method you use for fluids. So the showcase for every category, I'll have a showcase. Uh, for this is the Thiessen simulations. They've been released, the papers have been released uh, very recently, just before Christmas. And they actually simulate, well, it's a set of simulation, but their flagship simulation is almost 100 co-moving megaparsec. And they resolve structure, dark matter halos down to scales of about two times 10 to the eight solar masses. And this means they resolve nearly all of the atomically cooling halos. So the, these are ha halos or galaxies which reliably can form stars. And inside those galaxies, they actually result down to about 10 parsec. Um, the code they use is called ARIPO, which is a moving mesh code uh, using Voronoi tessellations. And as with all of these modern full physics simulations, they use the moment method with the so-called M1 closure. This was all done by three postdocs, I think, Raul Kanan, Enrico Garaldi, and Aaron Smith, based at uh, MPA in Garching, Munich, and at the MIT in, in uh, uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. And so here's their picture, their uh, promo picture, let's say, where you actually see in the background, you see again one of those evolution diagrams. So it's, it's similar to the one that we saw uh, before the cartoon character, but you see the level of detail is hugely different. So you see reionization progressing from the, from the left to the right here. Uh, but then inside, they actually have these structures where they actually can follow the, the evolution of the galaxies themselves. So this is quite impressive. Um, and to give you another idea, here's a, new, a movie they produced of the evolution of the 21 centimeter signal. So the signal disappears where there's ionization. And so the blue regions are, the blue and black regions are where the intergalactic medium is getting ionized. And you see a movie here where you see the growth of those regions. It's more and more galaxies form and ionize more and more of the intergalactic medium. In the top right corner, I can see if I can play it again. Uh, you see the, uh, the power spectrum of the uh, 21 centimeter signal, which is one of the main observables uh, that we, or the main statistical tools that we'll be using once we have the observations. So you can see a lot of things happening here. I don't have time to describe. What is interesting compared to many of the more simpler approaches that we'll be talking about later is that you see there, it's not entirely progressive all the time. So you see some uh, of the region sort of disappearing, appearing again as star formation is being stochastic. And this is something they can do in their types of simulation. So I encourage you to have a look at their, um, their, their web pages, really some, and papers. Uh, there's really some cool stuff there. Not my work though. This is not uh, my work. Um, so, okay, nice. We have all this physics. Uh, of course, it will be computationally expensive, but it's still great. So how do we use this? Well, because we have all the physics, we can do a physical insight prediction of observables because it's too slow. We can never do parameter estimation with this. Uh, but however, we can, of course, use these results to calibrate the simpler and the faster approaches. Um, maybe there's also a disadvantage to all this complexity because you have to put in a lot of physics. Uh, some of the physics you're still not resolving, let's say star formation. If you only have 10 parsecs, you can't really follow star formation in any detail. Uh, but we don't really know if it fits, let's say they tune their model to fit the observations, but are those fit truly unique? Um, that's a difficult question to answer with such expensive uh, simulations. There's also some drawbacks to the moment methods, which were explained uh, in a recent paper by Wu et al, mostly towards the end of reionization. 
Uh, there are a couple of codes that can do these type of simulations. So this was the one we saw. It's a repo uh, developed by Frogo Spring and co-workers. There's also Gizmo by Phil Hopkins, the Ramses code developed by Romain Tegier. The art code is still being used, developed by Kraftsoft and Canadian. This was actually the first code to be used in the year 2000 for a very small volume, but it's still, uh, they, they've kept it going and it's they can do larger volumes now as well. And then Emma developed by Dominique Colbert and co-workers. Um, so let's go to the simpler, uh, the simplest approach you could say. So this is where you simulate reionization, but you try to avoid doing anything in with detailed simulation techniques so you use approximate simulation techniques and the the main approximation is not to do radiative transfer you do the radiative transfer of the ionizing photons using a so-called excursion set approach um, which essentially means you don't need to do the radiative transfer you found you count photons in re in certain regions and you compare that to how much matter there is and if there are more photons than matter you say this region is going to be ionized because there are enough photons to ionize it uh, this is a very fast and efficient approach and it's and it it gives actually quite impressive results given how simple the, the picture is the other types of simulations are often included by some sort of convolution because you don't really need to do the, the, the transfer the, again it's more like photon counting uh, the hydrodynamics is not included often gravity can be some sort of zeldovich like approach or possibly you do some post processing of pre-computed embodied results so density fields and and dark matter halos the truly flagship code for this is 21 centimeter fast. This was also the original code of this approach, um, which is uh, uses second order Lagrangian approach for the gravity and then conditional press sector to find out where the structures are forming that are producing the photons. The excursion set approach for transferring ionizing radiation, but the X-rays the Lyman Alpha and the Lyman Werner are done in a convolutionary way. And there's a subgrid model for the recombinations taking place in the ionized intergalactic medium, developed by Andre Messenger and many co workers. And this code is really very popular. Many people use it. It's easy to use, it's fast. You can run it on your laptop. And it's also fast enough to do Monte Carlo Markov chain. Um, and there's a, a, an infrastructure called 21CMMC which was developed by Brad Greich that has been used for many uh, 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 to interpret many of the upper limits that have been uh, found by various radio telescopes over the world. So again, we see a little light cone here. This time it's running, uh, yeah, it's running from the right to the left where you see the different phases. I'm not gonna go through it. This is the global signal. So the average signal is a function of redshift or frequency. And this is how the, fluctuations at a certain scale develop. So basically one mode of the power spectrum. Um, so these simulations are perfect for model fitting and they've been used for that, they've been developed for that. And to some level you can predict observables with them as well. Um, there are lots of approximations in it uh, and it's not always so clear if this introduces any biases in the model fitting. Um, there are probably more, there are a couple of things you can worry about. For example, if you have the dominance of very high mass halos, the, it lacks the Poisson noise in the halo distribution there. So it's better if you reionization is done with lower mass halos. That's where the, they do a better prediction. There are issues with so-called photon conservation, which means that you actually kind of lose photons. They're not being used. Um, and this can give you uncertainties in the, the reionization, the progress of reionization between 0.2 and 1 in redshift, as shown by a recent paper by Park et al. This has been studied a lot also by one of the, I think one of the persons in the audience, or maybe both. Um, so there's, there's a lot to be said about here, but I won't do that here. It's something to be aware of. Um, I'm slightly, myself, slightly worried about the implementation of wretched space distortions. 
we'll talk about those later in in 21 centimeter fast and recently we discovered a rather odd behavior due to the maximum scale for radiative transfer that's in the code so there's still room for improving the accuracy and i'm sure they've been do improving things a lot over the years they are working hard to improve it even more so let's look at this r max so this is uh, a parameter which limits how far uh, photons uh, can travel essentially or can can have an influence on the intergalactic medium seen from the uh, from the source so if you have a galaxy producing photons you let those photons only reach out to a certain distance 10 20 40 or 70 megaparsec are the cases we have in the figure here and it's a hard barrier so the photons can travel up to that distance and then they they're removed let's say they don't do anything else and this is meant to implement an effect that we know exists in the intergalactic medium the ionized intergalactic medium it has been measured at lower redshift that photons ionizing photons don't have an infinite mean free path they actually after on average after, after traveling a certain distance they will have been absorbed uh, by the small scale structures and so this implements this effect but if you implement it as a hard barrier, which essentially means it's a free path and no longer a mean free path, because it's the same free path in all directions, um, you actually get a break in the power spectrum. And this is most easily seen by looking at the 21 centimeter bias. So this is the ratio between the 21 centimeter power spectrum and the matter power spectrum. Uh, and so you plot this against scale, the K, the K scale uh, of the power spectra. And then you see these curves, which are have an increasing bias as you go to larger scales. And then if you follow the blue line here, which is the shortest mean free path, then it, it has this break. And after that, it's sort of horizontal. Uh, but if you change the mean free path to 40, let's follow the orange curve, the, the, the rise continues until it reaches this point sorry, the purple one, which is this point, and then it goes horizontal. And the break is rather sudden. Uh, it's really a sharp break. Um, and so this is because of the way it's implemented as a very hard barrier. Now, physically, it's not a hard barrier, and also it will vary from place to place. So if you want to avoid this, and maybe you would want to avoid this, you should use either the inhomogeneous recombinations that have been introduced to 21 centimeter fast, or possibly a more softer barrier that was proposed by Davis and Ferlanetto in 2020. There are quite a few of these semi-numerical codes. Uh, the three, the, the ones on the left are more, contain many more uh, physics, so galaxy formation, parameterizations, etc. maybe Lyman-Werner um, uh, effects or uh, the heating. I think the ones on the right um, are more straightforward following the uh, ionizing photons, um, uh, but not many of the other processes. So they are good for following the reionization, but not what happened slightly before that. Um, okay, then we get to the third type. Um, these are called full radiative transfer simulations. And so they are essentially based on doing the radiative transfer accurately. You want to do it in 3D, you want to do it multi-frequency, and you really want to follow how do the photons travel through the intergalactic medium. However, you don't, in these simulations, you, that this is where the focus is, but you don't do the for the gravity in the hydrodynamics you do an m body simulation possibly a hydrodynamic simulation without radiative transfer and you use those results you post process those results so you don't change the density field you don't change the galaxy properties but you just transfer the photons <clears throat> in that uh, pre-computed field so if you have an m body uh, density field with dark matter halos. You use simple recipes to do help to implement the galaxy formation and evolution. If you have hydrodynamic simulations, you would use the star formation rate that came out of that simulation. Um, 
The good thing here is that you can use radiative transfer techniques that are a bit more expensive than the moment method, but more accurate. Uh, so the moment method that's being used in the full physics simulations. Um, so you can do ray tracing um, or you can do Monte Carlo radiative transfer. And this is the showcase here is the code that I developed myself together with Ilian Ilyev called C2Ray where indeed we use typically use an embody pre-computed embody results for the, the evolution of the density and evolution of the dark matter halo population we have a simple recipe for the galaxy evolution and we follow how the ionizing photons travel through the intergalactic medium and, and ionize it in 3d and with multi-frequency following hydrogen and helium ionizing photons we also do the same thing for the x-rays uh, and then the Lyman Alpha and the Lyman Werner, which is more of a, they, they don't, uh, they, they are actually done with convolutions. They don't have a direct effect on reionization. So on the right, you see again a light cone. Uh, this time, time goes from the left to the right, where you, this is from the paper by Hannah Ross et al., where we follow the, the dark, uh, sorry, the transition from the dark ages into the cosmic dawn where uh, X-rays are heating the intergalactic medium. So you have uh, lots of absorption first as um, uh, the uh, intergalactic medium is still cold and then the X-ray source is heated patchily and then it's heated. And here towards the very end, you see some white patches appearing. This is where reionization is happening. Um, so we use these simulations again to get physical insight. You can change the recipes and test. You know what does it, uh, what happens if you have uh, more high mass halos, more high mass halos dominating the process, or, or or it's more dominated by low mass halos, and also do prediction of observables and developing new statistical tools. It's too slow to do model fitting. Um, what is good though is, and this is not always the case in, in some of the semi-numerical simulations so the second category, is we get a full history. If we actually follow the evolution of the intergalactic medium step by step. Uh, um, and um, we have to do use subgrid, subgrid recipes, for example, for the galaxy evolution, but it's extremely flexible in principle. We can we can make those recipes much more sophisticated and time dependent and position dependent, etc. Um, but of course, there is no feedback on the hydrodynamics and the temperature evolution, etc. Uh, so so it's not full physics in that sense. Um, where chal the challenging part is to actually resolve enough of the small scale structure. So really we would like to move these simulations to use adaptive mesh. Um, what I think these full radiative transfer simulations are really good for are looking at large volumes, uh, which are too large to do with full physics. And maybe you want to do it a bit more accurate than with semi-numerical simulations. So hundreds of co-moving microparsec, the scales that we're observing with LOFAR, MWA, SKA in the future. And actually, this is not entirely trivial. Uh, um, one of the bottlenecks is actually to have sufficiently high mass resolution for your M body. Because if you want to absorb, uh, resolve those small 10 to the 8 solar mass halos, which are the, the atomically cooling halos that that are uh, likely to be important. In something like 700 co-moving megaparsec, you need 14 trillion particles in your M-body. Well, the largest M-body simulation to date is only 4.4 trillion. So it's actually beyond the reach of the, the largest one. Uh, just up, and then we don't, we're not even talking about the amount of storage that is needed to actually save those particle distributions, et cetera. So th there's quite a bit of uh, numeric computational challenge there. Uh, I have two examples of what we did with uh, uh, our full numerical, uh, uh, full 
radiative transfer simulation. So the first one, to, to, to recent uh, examples, is about line of sight effect. So we've been seeing these light cones. Here's another one. Here, uh, time goes from right to left. You, you notice there's not really a convention uh, in, the, in the literature on whether it should go this way or that way. Um, uh, but this is this represents a, a, an observation of the 21 centimeter signal at different frequencies, so so-called tomographic 3D tomographic data set. But if you analyze this data set, you should be aware that the frequency there are a couple of effects along the frequency direction. There's a light cone effect, which uh, uh, means that the signal actually evolves, reionization evolves along the uh, the frequency direction. There are redshift space distortions because the gas has uh, velocity, velocities and it can redshift or blue shift away from its cosmological redshift. And this depends on the density field. And so there it introduces structures and anisotropies in the 21 centimeter signal. And those two we've studied before, uh, including work that uh, Kanandata did when he was in Stockholm. Um, uh, and and also uh, Suman Mayumdar uh, worked uh, on redshift space distortions when he was in Stockholm. There's a third effect, which is not a physical effect, but it, this is introduced if we have imperfect knowledge of our cosmological model. And this is known as the alcock prochinsky effect. Um, uh, and this was never really been studied using numerical simulations. Um, and what happens is, uh, if we do an observation, we have angles on the sky and we have frequencies along the line of sight. And we have to map those back to megaparsecs in order to say something about the power spectrum or sizes of regions. But if you're, cos if you're, cosmologic if you're not using the correct cos cosmological model, the mapping of frequencies to megaparsec and angles to megaparsec is not done in the same way. And so what what should be a spherical object to begin uh, in, in space, let's say, would become slightly squashed because of a, a mistake you make in your uh, cosmological model. And so this can introduce an additional anisotropy. So as I said, this was never studied before numerically. So I had a visiting student from France called Ansel Larzul. And so we looked at this using our full radiative transfer simulations in a large box, a 700 megaparsec box, which really is necessary to properly uh, study these things. And so we assumed a 10% error on omega matter. So we say, okay, the true omega matter is this, but we assume a, a value that is 10% different. And you can easily show the basics of the uh, alcock pachinsky effect shows that this gives you 2% anisotropy in the shape of your spherical objects. Of course, in the, the light cone, there are no spherical objects as such, so, but it, it introduces an, an anisotropy in the analysis of the power spectrum. And so we studied the anisotropy of the power spectrum characterized by this anisotropy parameter R, which I won't explain in, in detail, but it's a simple number that characterizes uh, the anisotropy in the power spectrum between the line of sight direction and the plane of the sky direction. And if it's zero, it's isotropic. And so we see here a result. The solid line is if we don't have the alcock pachinsky effect. So we know the cosmology perfectly. And then we get this evolution. Here's the average ionization uh, fraction. Uh, so reionization goes from left to right. And you see that there's this evolution of the anisotropy. And it's in this R, it's about 5, 10, 20% an anisotropic. Um, and um, uh, then if we add the alcock pachinsky effect, assuming this 10% error on omega matter, we actually get a different line. So yes, the alcock pachinsky effect is affecting the anisotropy of the power spectrum with about between 1 and 10% ballpark number. So that's substantial in some sense. However, we then look, can we actually know if we do an observation, we don't know what the correct omega matter is. Uh, 
in principle. So can we actually see from the results that this anisotropy is partly due to the alcohol Pruszynski effect? Is there something that gives that away? Can we separate anisotropy from alcohol Pruszynski from the redshift space distortions? And the answer is no. We couldn't find any good way to separate them, which means that if the alcohol Pruszynski effect is there in the observations, it will be an, a narrow bar essentially on the anisotropy caused by the redshift space distortions. But we will not be able to do cosmology with the 21 centimeter signal by identifying the magnitude of the alcohol Pruszynski effect. Um, let's skip this actually. Um, so, no, we're not skip now. Uh, I'll do it. So we also recently with, with uh, uh, my PhD student Evelyn Georgiev uh, looked at the large scale 21 centimeter power spectrum. So really looking at very large scales, which we now know from the low far work that we can actually say something about. And we analyzed it in different ways. First of all, we looked at the shape. So how does it is does it trace in what part does it trace? So the the density. Uh, power spectrum or does it uh, is it more characterized by the neutral fraction power spectrum how does that depend on the phase of reionization here we're looking at the neutral fraction so it's, time evolution goes from right to left and what we see is that it's the in but near all the cases we studied it's the neutral fraction power spectrum that dominates so the shape of the 21 centimeter power spectrum on large scales is identical to the shape of the neutral fraction power spectrum the other ones are really subdominant. Uh, there's some high order terms here as well. The other thing is this study of the bias and how it depends on the mean free path, this R max that we saw in 21 centimeter fast. So we use the full radiative transfer to test this. We don't see a similar sharp break here, even if we have a hard barrier. But we also see that if we have a, a softer barrier, which is here called LLS, um, uh, we see that this affects the uh, the um, the transition from this rising bias to a more flat bias at large scales. Um, and so we it's still the interesting thing is that the, the large scale 21 centimeter bias, so the ratio with the matter power spectrum, is during large parts of reionization fairly flat. So it's a linear bias, which is interesting. But where the transition happens depends on the mean free path. Okay, so examples of the radiative transfer codes. Um, I talked a lot about C2Ray, my own code. So there's the other one is uh, that has uh, a, a very mean similar features, but is based on Monte Carlo radiative transfer. It's called Crash and was developed by Benedetta Ciardi and co-workers. Okay, then the fourth category are approximate radiative transfer codes. So they say, yeah, it's good to do radiative transfer, but it's too expensive. Can we not find a shortcut somewhere? And the shortcut is by reducing the dimensionality. So you do radiative transfer, but you do it with a reduced dimensionality. Um, specifically, yeah, I, I mean, with the, we'll see it in one dimension. So you essentially say every source as uh, affects a spherical region around itself and its effect is the same in all directions. Otherwise, the setup is very similar to the full radiative transfer codes. So the showcase here is a code called Grizzly, which was developed by uh, Raghunath Gara uh, and collaborators. Um, and so it does the radiative transfer using 1D ray tracing, you could call it pre-computes spherical solutions to the radiative transfer problem and inserts this around the sources. Uh, does the same for the X-rays, but Lyman alpha is done through convolutions. Um, and this makes it fast enough so that you can actually do model fitting. Uh, and here as an example, um, uh, I include a model that was computed by Grizzly which actually is excluded by the low for upper limits that were published in 2020. Um, so we can do the full Monte Carlo. Uh, so here's the corner plot for the Monte Carlo Markov chain. Uh, and we constrain these uh, 
intergalactic medium parameter, so the average uh, volume of the um, IGM that has been ionized, that has been heated, the average temperature of the neutral medium, the average 21 centimeter signal, the rather global signal, and something about the size distribution of the heated regions is what is shown here. Um, I'll refer to the paper for all the details. So this could be done with radiative transfer, but at a reduced dimensionality. Um, so this type of code is good for the model fitting, and to some extent, I guess you can also do prediction of observables. This is what Drago did in his PhD thesis. Uh, he looked at various effects, also the light cone effect and redshift space distortions, for example. Um, of course, there are approximations here. What are the biases the, is introduced? Are, we don't really know um, so well. We know that for a simple setup, Grizzly produces essentially identical results to C2A. So the basics is OK, but if you start using it for model fitting, maybe you have to be a bit more careful. Uh, another disadvantage is there's no a real history. We don't follow reionization as such. We put in these solutions for different times, but there isn't a, a progression in that sense. Um, it also actually interesting, uh, has no implementation of the mean free path yet, but I'm sure that it will be fixed. Um, we're currently working, or Ragu is actually currently working on coupling it to, to galaxy formation and evolution. Uh, calculations. Um, so it's a rather unique code until a couple of years ago when Margareta Molaro, um, together with Mario Santos, published an algorithm which I don't think hasn't been really used that much. It's called Artist, but it's similar in philosophy. So they do radiative transfer in a few directions. Not it's not entirely spherical, uh, so it's more like six directions or something. I don't, I don't remember the exact number, but it's and, and the idea is the same. You do radiative transfer, but at, with a reduced dimensionality in order to speed it up, and so this could be an interesting method to keep an eye on. So those were the four methods. Uh, so what you know we have a, lots of, and then there are many different versions of them. So lots of methods. So what what you know, how do we deal with this? What, you know, first, I guess the basic question even is like, if you do a simulation with 21 centimeter fast and you do another one with C2Ray, do they agree? Um, and, uh, or does C2Ray agree with the Thiessen simulations? And these kind of comparisons have been done in the past quite a few times. But often, I guess you want to define your comparison in a clean way, and this often means that it's a rather idealized or limited case you're investigating. Also, you know, for a Monte Carlo Markov chain, you're going to compute thousands of models or 10,000 models. Not all of those have been compared to another method. So, so I don't think we've answered all the questions about whether the codes agree in all cases and what are the you know, biases that could be introduced. Um, this is why the SKA Observatory is uh, interested in uh, doing a theory data challenge. So they've done a couple of observational data challenges that you may know about, but we're now busy together with Anna Bonaldi to develop a theory data challenge uh, which uh, should appear maybe later this year. Uh, so the idea is that we, we give the participants a 21 centimeter power spectrum, uh, or maybe a series of them at different redshifts, and then ask them to estimate the mean ionized fraction of the intergalactic medium, at least. Maybe some other parameters we haven't fully settled on that, but definitely the mean ionized fraction. But the power spectrum could be from Thiessen, or it could be from C2A, or it could be from 21 centimeter fast, or maybe we'll actually have a few. So we, we test uh, these. And this will, and then we'll ask, you know, derive the parameters. So this, these have to be the model fitting codes that do this. So you grizzly 21 centimeter fast, um, maybe some of the other semi numerical codes. 
Um, so this will be an interesting exercise and I'm, I'm really keen to see the results on that. The other question you can ask is whether, you know, to, if we can do full physics, why not do full physics? And, and that's, that's a valid question. But actually, there was a recent paper, a study by um, Hassan Sultan, uh, where he took a, f a sort of full physics uh, simulation called Simba, and he did the reionization calculation, and then he also derived a number of simple recipes for galaxy evolution, uh, calibrated to give the same reionization history, uh, but but losing the, the variations that exist inside the full physics simulation between the galaxies, so the stochasticity, and actually he finds you found that they get, you know, it doesn't matter if you have a simple recipe, you get the same morphology, same power spectra. So you don't really need to know for every individual galaxy in your simulation what it did. If you get the average right, you get the answer right for reionization at least. So um, I think that this is promising for both for the semi numerical and the approximate and full radius transfer uh, simulations. Uh, that uh, don't follow the individual evolution of galaxies. So I think I should stop here. I'm really a bit over time. Um, so conclusions, there's a wide range of simulation techniques available and also codes. All of them have advantages and disadvantages. I tried to list a few of them. Um, uh, I think if you're thinking of using a simulation, you should first think what you want to achieve, what, what is your goal, and then find the most appropriate tool. And maybe if it's covered by different codes and you're able to use different codes, you could even use two codes. We did this, for example, for the large scale 21 centimeter power spectrum project. We used both 21 centimeter fast and we used the, the, the full um, uh, radiation transfer C2A simulations for that. Uh, whatever tool you choose, you should be always be aware, aware of the limitations it has. And I think in general, we need more advanced cross-validation between the different uh, codes, especially when it comes to biases, when we start using them to interpret future observational data. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Garrett, for the nice talk. So now the floor open for questions. So please unmute yourself and ask questions. Yeah. Question uh, here. Yeah, please. Uh, am, am I audible? Yeah. Okay. Hi, hi Garrett. It's a nice talk. So I was wondering that, uh, so between these simulations, are there certain statistical measures which are uh, all reproduced uh, same or I mean, is there a trend? Um, can like you... for example, the power spectra is reproduced up to a certain scale, uh, similarly in all the simulations, but above ah. or below a certain scale, it is not that type of signature. Um, in the various comparisons, often the power spectra have been compared uh, because this is an, an important uh, observable and it's, yeah, it's the first statistical tool. So often, so there, I think in general, for example, for the semi-numerical codes, they agree quite well, the power spectra agree quite well with the uh, full, num full radiative transfer codes, typically. Um, you could say that that yeah they that um for other uh that's a good question i uh, actually i don't know maybe someone in the audience knows let's say if you would do the bi spectrum is there agreement between semi-numerical and full radiative transfer i don't know maybe suman knows Did we ever do that comparison? I don't, I'm not sure. I, 
I had another question. Yeah. Uh, which is that uh, so when you uh, measured or defined a measure for the anisotropy of the power spectrum, the anisotropy was with respect to mu, which is the angle with the line of sight direction. Yes. Yes. Yeah. But if I imagine a, a, a sphere being uh, replaced by an ellipse, it may happen in many other directions as well. I mean, if it's not just because of light cone. So is it? I mean, sometimes we ha I have seen in other other places in their literature that well, uh, they the, use, the S, uh, like but maximum to minimum mm -hmm. ratio, etc. We looked at the anisotropy in different ways in the project um we're still uh working on putting this together in a paper um so this is not the only way we looked at the anisotropy um and so and the conclusion doesn't really change uh, but i think in general so the uh, the redshift space distortions create I mean, the, the, the dominant, the axis are the anisotropy caused by redshift space distortions have these axes that are so perpendicular and along the line of sight. So they, I don't know, there could be slight, I, I think you actually do, it, they're, you know, yeah, yeah. those, they're, they're power laws of mu actually. So in, in that sense, it is, and, and, and the same thing can be said for the alcohol Pachinsky. So I don't think there's a big disadvantage of doing this two bin. I mean, okay. essentially you're comparing two bins in mu, the angle between the line of sight and the uh, uh, line of the sky. Yeah. So the RSTs are always like uh, the parallel and perpendicular to the line of sight. There will be uh, different. But uh, for example, the environmental effects, uh, that can be any direction, right? Which effects? Sorry, I have. Uh, environmental effects in the sense ah. in the sense that maybe there is already a yeah, so dark matter uh, void or I mean there's filament or something. Yes, but 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 we're it's doing this in very large scale uh, volumes where you average oh, out. So, so th those have yeah, you them. average out all of okay. those environmental effects. You're seeing so many different filaments and structures that this is all averaged out. Um, okay, thanks, thanks. Hi, Gareth, this is Teeth. Uh, okay. Thanks, thanks for the nice summary. This was very useful. So, Aaron, this is, of course, uh, back to the uh, excursion set uh, quotes and, and the photon conservation. So, when uh, we were uh, looking at this photon conservation very carefully, uh, one thing we were finding is, uh, okay, photon conservation is a very uh, serious issue, but that was leading to power spectrum at large scales that were numerically not converging uh, with respect to the resolution at which you are making the maps. In other words, if you keep the same physics, do two excursion sets having two different resolutions, the large scale power spectra won't match. And this may have serious implications for uh, like parameter estimation. Mm -hmm. It will now depend on what resolution you choose. Yes. So, yes. Yeah. So, this is something which was worrying us uh, quite a bit about the excursion set uh, and, and how they could be used for uh, parameter estimation. So, so this is correct, um, and um, the um, we we actually uh, looked at this because when we looked at our bias, we, we weren't looking at the photon conservation. We were just you know, uh, using this as a way to analyze a large scale uh, power spectrum. But then we we uh, uh, we actually checked it, and so we confirmed the behavior that you found when we looked at 21 okay. centimeter fast. So that so that that is definitely there. Um, the yes, so this is a serious issue. The Park at all paper did a bit more than just give a magnitude. They claim to have a fix for it in 21 centimeter fast. But they did unfortunately they did not show that this resolves the issue with resolution. Yes. So, um, uh, it's, 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 yeah, uh, this is, there's a big, 
question mark here uh i suppose yeah um so so it would be good if if, if this could be sorted out really yeah yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. so hopefully during the comparison project we will find yeah some kind yeah. of a solution yeah. this would actually show i mean the same with this r max right so i'm, I'm really yes. worried if you have such a strong uh effect here a strong break yes. this will be very easy for monte carlo markov chain to pick up but it's yes. unphysical it's not going to be that sharp so so these things are you know they as i say you know we know a lot about the codes but there's also still things that because <laughs> we only discovered this recently yeah yeah thanks so uh, i have another i have another question related to thyssen simulation uh, the the question is uh, how accurate is the 21 centimeter modeling in Thyssen given that the Thyssen simulation is 64 H inverse co moving megaparsec in box size? And you mentioned that 100 H inverse co moving is needed to sample the dark matter halos. Yeah. Uh, so it's not going to be so useful for, let's say, 21 centimeter predictions. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's accurate in, in as such, I think, um, mm -hmm. um, but it's not going to give an answer to, uh, uh, yeah, the you know, if you want to predict SKA observations, etc. It's not going to be so useful. I think it will be very useful though for maybe improving some of the more approximate modeling that is in the in the large scale simulations. Yeah. Yeah. And Enrico was visiting us quite some days back and he was not planning to extend the box size because it's too expensive for them. Yeah, so no, no. Not... I mean, the, the same, I guess yeah. the thing to realize with, with volumes, if you don't know this already, is that, you know, everything, yeah. it's a cube, right? So it's cube. Exactly. Everything is cubed. So if you just yes. increase by a factor of two this is eight times more particles to get the same resolution and so it very quickly becomes too too, too expensive yeah but but I, I i i think i yes so this is so you know you use the tools that uh, to some extent people do the simulations they can do let's say mm -hmm. uh, although there are always choices i mean they could have maybe done a bigger volume but then mm -hmm. uh, cut out all the low mass halos. But then you yes. can say, okay, they don't have the low mass halo, so you know how realistic is this? So they, I, I actually no, no. think they did a, a good choice by including the lower mass halos down to almost down to ten to the eight. I think that was a very smart choice to do. I mean, but then how we, how would we compare our ready to transfer with full? I mean, the same analytical methods with the full ready to transfer if they are not going to probe that scale. So that's what my question was. Next. <laughs> um, that's a good question. Um, well, I mean, we could try to do full radiator transfer cross-processing using their uh, photon production, mm -hmm. so their galaxy evolution data. Yeah. This is more or less, I think, what Sultan Hassan did in, uh, in this other case, um, where he found but I don't, I think in this case, he didn't do the, the photo ionization was all post-processing. So he didn't do, but he, he did use mm -hmm. the galaxy evolution data for, for, for this particular mm -hmm. type of post-processing. So right. yeah, we will have to see. I mean, this is, I mean, this is yeah. often the problem with comparisons that you have to yeah. In order to compare two codes, they have to do the same calculation or at least equivalent exactly. calculation. Yes. And sometimes yes. certain codes are not able to do that one. So then you choose exactly. a sort of common denominator, which uh, unfortunately then means that the comparison is, is imperfect because you're not actually comparing the case. You, you, you will be using that one both codes for. Uh, so that, that, that is why I think you know, maybe focusing on using this kind of uh, model fitting uh, to see how 
reliable, at least the semi-numerical and the approximate radiative transfer methods are is maybe a good angle because that that is where we will be using those codes mainly. Yeah, that's right. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Any other? Yeah, so I. Yeah. Please, yeah. Yeah, so I have I have a question. Uh, so this is regarding uh, the mean free path. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so is it uh, is it correct that if you uh, if you have larger mean free path, then the power spectrum at large scale is more compared to the uh, lesser mean free path? Um, I think this is. So we looked at this both with 21 centimeter fast and um, yes, so this is what we found, the amplitudes, okay. but, but, but the problem is that these are, these are compared at the same ionis, uh, mean ionization fraction or neutral fraction in this case. So this is 23, 24% neutral and these, because you're limiting or more or less the transfer, the spread of the photons, these are not at the same, um, uh, they're not at the same redshift. So this, so when you compare them at the same phase, yes, if you have a longer mean free path, you have the amplitude of the, the large scale power spectrum is higher. But some of this may be due to redshift differences. This is what I'm going to say. Okay. But we see the same effect in 21 centimeter fast. Um, no, yeah, yeah, we see that. But so, th sorry, this is what I wanted to say. So here, here we also for the the la later stages, so 22 percent neutral. We actually see for two values of the mean, the same value of the mean free path, but one is a hard barrier and the other one is a soft barrier. The softer barrier means that only one one third of the photons will have been absorbed by that distance. So it's like an optical depth of one. Uh, we get actually get a larger amplitude bias for the softer barrier. But again, this could be a, a difference in redshift. Um, I don't know. Is Evo is in the audience? If is it the redshift difference or are there actually intrinsic differences? Do you know? I don't know if he's willing to answer. He probably wasn't prepared for answering questions, maybe. But if ionization, uh, ah. uh, if if I mean ionization fraction is same, then uh, do you think the redshift evolution will do? Uh, much of a difference between two? Uh, yes, there is actually a uh, red test. Okay. The, the bias does evolve with redshift, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Maybe I am audible, but I'm not too certain. Yes, you are. Ah, better than before. That's nice to hear. Hiya, I'm Ivo. Uh, for these simulations in this figure particularly, the redshift difference is not very... The difference between RMAX10 and L L S ten is not too much. Because okay, so the different in bias is really due to the different implementation of the mean free path effect here. Yeah, they use the same source models these two simulations. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, we can maybe talk about this more offline. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, I have one question. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, Nishikant, and uh, uh, I really enjoyed your talk. I uh, so my question was: uh, Have you uh, so what are the effects of the quasar uh, population on the twenty-one centimeter power spectrum? Because the quasar population is not very well constrained uh, at high redshifts. It's no. only the bright. Let's see. Well, that the. Uh, e Okay, the, the answer is we don't know, right? This is because we haven't measured anything yet. So we, it's not a question we can, we can answer about the universe. 
we can people have added quasars to their simulations and then it depends how you add them so do you have you know do you have this population of uh, many re relatively faint quasars which has been postulated by some observers and then they actually have quite a big impact uh, on on the at least on the heating uh, phase of the, the evolution so before you start reionization um, there was I showed as a here uh, this paper actually contains a number of models where uh, either kind of star formation so what we call high mass x-ray binaries are the cause of the source of x-rays or a quasar population and they they show very different evolution in this phase where the heating is happening but of course we don't know if that's true it's just in the simulation uh, so this is this is an unknown question and in some sense it would be wise to include quasars in the modeling and then you know in the end we we just well first we need to find the quasars and then maybe the 21 centimeter signal will give us more of a handle on whether they're really important or not but yeah so do we need a larger box for this uh, quasar addition because these are rarely bright sources now and you talked about that thousand megaparsec is needed for rarely bright sources yeah but i think if the quasar if we only have like a few quasars in every cubic geoparsec they're not going to matter mm -hmm. much for the ionization overall right. it's more if you want to see the effect of the quasar low somewhat locally and you want to have model the environment correctly then you need that large yes. volume but if you really need a large volume to to have yeah you we we will need i don't think we can do it with a few very bright okay <laughs> mm. It, it's it's okay. So we can we can of course have a discussion, but it's you know it's mostly star formation in galaxies, or it's mostly quasars. This used to be the, the classical discussion, and uh, if photons manage to escape from galaxies, then we don't need the quasars, right? So then then it's fine. We don't need quasars. They could help a little bit, but they're, they're not actually needed. However, if the photons, if the structure of the, those early galaxies is such that really only like you know, less than a percent of the photons can escape from them, th yeah. then we have a serious, then we need some other source for the ionizing photons. And then maybe the quasars, you know, even though they're not so many, they, they can make a big difference. But uh, based on simulations, it doesn't look like that's the case. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, the, the quasars universe has the right answer, right? Not, yeah. not us. I mean, the quasars will not only ionize hydrogen, but they will also ionize helium too. So that would also that's be the exactly image. that's one of the, that we do not uh, see uh, at higher shift, uh, yeah. uh, apart from proximity regions, of course. No, that's correct. Yeah. That's correct. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I think. Uh, uh, any other questions? Uh, if no, then we thank again Professor Malima for a nice talk and uh, and thank you all for joining this colloquium and we will meet again. Thank you, Prof. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Bye bye. Okay. Bye. Yeah. Thanks, guys.